I'm with the Jahai tribe, and we're surrounded by danger. Hunters could become hunted. The world's oldest blowpipe hunters survived using ancient weapons. Oh my goodness, oh. the skill. And animal cunning. Incredible, mm. fantastic. I'm Hayden Turner. As a zookeeper, I looked after monkeys for 10 years. But today, in this Malaysian rainforest, I'm with the Jahai tribe, and they're hunting them. Here, wildlife is food, not a zoo exhibit. The survival of these men depends on the animals around them. These hunters understand animal behavior here better than anyone in the world. And I want to learn from them. Masters of stealth and precision, the Jahai have developed supremely efficient weapons. Their blowpipes shoot deadly darts at 180 kilometers per hour, nearly as fast as a peregrine falcon in flight. I'll be with these men for the next 10 days, and I've got so much to learn. Only in his 30s, Aziz is already the most accurate shooter in the village quiet and focused. He has four young children to feed. His youngest is just three months old. <laughs> Quadri's the head of the small village where I'm staying. He has to ensure that all eight families living there are fed every day. At 45, he's been hunting for over 30 years. He's the best hunter in the village. On this hunt, the monkeys have the advantage. High up in the treetops, 35 meters above us, they can see for 20 kilometers. To make a kill, Quadri and Aziz need to be within 50 meters of the monkeys. So it's with stealth that they outwit their clever prey. I'm really worried that I'm going to be more of a problem on the hunt than uh, a positive force. It's all about stealth, it's all about quiet, it's all about whispering, it's all about hand signals. It's not a run and a chase through the forest. So with these size tens on, uh, I'm gonna have to watch my step. This hunt has three phases. Find the prey, get close, then deliver a fatal dart. But the monkeys mustn't see, hear or smell us. So we have to stay hidden. This is really draining me. It's the humidity that's getting to me. I've never been in a Malaysian rainforest before and I'm just not used to it. It's early in the morning, so Quadri and Aziz know the monkeys will be feeding. They hunt over a huge range, covering an area bigger than London. But Quadri's led us straight to the right trees. We've got to spot the monkeys before they spot us. Intelligent, social, and highly vocal, they communicate with each other over a kilometer. 
alert one monkey, and the whole troop will take flight. Quadri spots some monkeys. Now, the hunt is on. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. These hunters can spot animals I can't even see. Because they use their vision every day to find prey, their eyesight has become much better than 2020. Quadri sees that some monkeys have stopped eating. It's a sign that they're getting wary. We stop. Hidden from view, we watch and wait. We've already hiked five kilometers in 32 degree heat. The men have hardly broken a sweat, but I'm soaked through. Quadri knows the species because of the troop's behaviour. Dusky leaf monkeys spread out when foraging, and now they're on the move. These monkeys can weigh up to 12 kgs, but they'll only yield about half as much meat as a turkey of the same size. To feed all 35 people in the village, the men need to catch at least two. That could be an alarm call. Have we lost the prey? I'm really torn here. Part of me wants the animals to get away, but if we don't bring back some meat, there's only maize, rice and tapioca to eat in the village, which is all the tribe had for breakfast, their only other meal of the day. Finally, I see one of the monkeys. The troops within range, just 40 metres away. To better their chance of a kill, Aziz and Quadri separate. Separating doubles the hunter's chance of success. But it also doubles the risk of being spotted. The darts are tipped with a deadly poison. Once it enters the bloodstream, it stops the animal's heart. That can happen in seconds, or it can take hours, depending on where the dart hits and the size of the prey. As he shoots, he hits a monkey. The darts are silent, so the other monkeys aren't alarmed. Quadri takes a shot. He hits another. We've been hunting for five hours, but we could still go back empty-handed. If the monkeys are startled, they'll be off. 
before the poison takes effect. Bit of a coughing sound the monkey makes before it falls out of the tree. But the second monkey is still in the tree. I can see it. Up there. Well. Success. Nothing is wasted. Brains, tail, liver, everything is eaten except where the poison dart pierced the skin. Even so, these two monkeys will only provide about eight kgs of meat, about the same as six chickens. And it doesn't really matter what my perception of wildlife is, because to the Jahai, wildlife is food, is their family, and the forest supplies them with everything. This place is a very important place to them. Without monkey meat, the Jahai's diet would be so deficient in calories, they wouldn't survive. 40% of the Jahai's protein comes from monkeys. But at least tonight, everyone will eat well, because the Jahai way is to share. Community is everything. <laughs> Each family receives an equal share, which they cook and eat at home. 80% of the Jahai's food is protein from meat or fish. The survival of the whole village depends on the hunters. The Jahai live in the northernmost part of the Malay Peninsula, near the border with Thailand in the Belem Temengor Forest. They are one of 18 indigenous tribes of mainland Malaysia. But as the Western world encroaches onto their land, their traditional way of life is being eroded. Today there are fewer than 900 Jahai. Their ancestors were the first people to live in this ancient forest. For thousands of years, they've passed their traditions and hunting strategies down through the generations. This forest still gives the Jahai everything they need. Shelter, food, medicines, weapons. It provides, but it also kills. The Jahai share this forest with dangerous animals. They can't grow many crops or vegetables as their village would be raided by hungry elephants. A tiger took a young boy from a village nearby. It's too dangerous for the Jahai to keep any farm animals or store any fresh meat. So the hunters must bring home food every day. And they use only ancient weapons. These pieces are made by hand and all the materials come from the forest. So it's not like uh, you've gone down the shop to try and buy a few parts to make your blowpipe. Every single part comes out of the environment. The smallest bend and the blowpipe wouldn't work. These precision weapons must be as straight as the barrel of a gun. Yet Quadri and Jakub only use a razor blade and their eyesight. Jakub lives in a neighboring village. At 45, he's a very experienced hunter and a close friend of Quadri's. And today, they've joined forces to hunt a giant rodent. But every time these men go hunting, they risk their lives. We're in the same terrain, we're in the same environment as tigers, an Asiatic elephant. And at any point, the hunters could become an hunter. We're en route to hunt porcupines. From what I gather, we're going to get the tracks, locate the burrow, and then smoke them out. Now I've had first-hand experience with porcupines in the wild, and they can turn grown men 
into running children. Just one porcupine can provide 15 kgs of meat. High in fat and calories, one animal can give five times more meat than a small monkey. There are 24 species found worldwide. Today we're hunting Malayan porcupines. They have over 30,000 needle sharp quills, weigh up to 30 kgs, and they're aggressive. When threatened, they will attack. Porcupine are nocturnal, so we're looking for tracks that will lead us to their burrows. Even in this dense undergrowth, it takes Quadri, Yakub and Caillou just minutes to find footprints. Caillou is in his 60s and a grandfather to two, but he's still an expert tracker. So here, I can see the toenails there. Like here, here. These footprints mean that porcupines are close, but elephants may be closer. Just last night, the cameraman and I were woken up by a 30-year-old bull elephant. He was investigating what was in our tent whilst we were still in it. It was a tense time. Last year, wild elephants killed 500 people. Now, we're really on our guard. For thousands of years, the Jahai have lived with the threat of elephants. They do everything they can to avoid them, but even in this vast forest, confrontations still happen. Caillou's keeping watch, but I'm not sure what Quadri's doing. Jakob, what are these, these for? put in the ground to block mm. the holes. So you put them, you put them like this. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. And that'll be in front of the hole. So the animal can only come out of one hole. First, we've got to find the burrow. Caillou is searching for the freshest tracks. Even though the prints are only four centimeters across, by spotting minute differences in the definition of the tracks, the hunters have led us straight to an active burrow. Porcupine burrows are a complex system of tunnels and chambers, measuring up to 18 metres long. With any number of entry and exit holes, the hunters must block off each one. So the men are now finding the entry and the exit holes. The men are very, very cautious because these things have to be stuck in very, very hard. This is a formidable creature. So the men now have decided that this is the burrow. These are the two points of entry and exit. They've checked for other areas, and it seems to be ready to, time to smoke them out. The plan is to fan in enough smoke to alarm the animal, but not kill it while it's still inside the burrow. <laughs> okay. So the smoking has started down there. They're fanning the smoke into the burrow. And the smoke will rise up the burrow. The men have strategically placed the sticks in a way that the animal's head will be able to come through, but not its body. And that way, Jakob will be able to 
spirit without getting a, a quill in his leg, or in my legs for that matter. You can see the smoke coming out right now, that quickly. The porcupine could come out here any minute. I really don't want to get close to this creature. A porcupine quill could go right through my arm. A lot of people underestimate the uh, fierce ability of porcupines. I've seen them in the wild myself, and I've seen large predators like leopard and lion try and take on a porcupine, and they will assault. They will, they will back themselves in either sideways. Oh, There's another bat. <laughs> Did you see him? There's a lot of bats flying out of here as well. I can see why the men and myself are a little bit on edge. One spear kills the porcupine in seconds. My goodness. Just came out of there like lightning. <laughs> but this hunt isn't over. There's another one coming. Get out, get out. The sticks give the men time to spear the porcupine, but I didn't realize that it would only be seconds. I can hear the porcupine's quills. I know it's close, but it stopped moving. Suddenly, Quadri takes a big risk. So that one's actually already dead. Asphyxiated by the smoke. Oh, yeah. Two porcupines from the one burrow. And this is on the top of the list of meat for the Jahai. That is a very, very good day's hunting. These two porcupines will provide about 30 kilograms of meat. This will feed everyone in Jakob and Kodri's villages tonight. But these porcupines don't just provide food. So these are the best, these are the best ones for, for the nose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The Jahai use porcupine quills as jewelry. Quills are modified hair, made from keratin, the same substance as our hair and nails. Similar to the shaft of a feather, they are hollow tubes, but with a very, very sharp point. <laughs> when did you get your, your nose pierced? That would be a good one for my nose. Pilih, pilih, do pilih. Pilih yang ada dia ada ilok tu baru ada. Okay, Kodri, go. Oh, takut lah. I'm joking. <laughs> so that was exactly to plan. It was straight out of the Juhai textbook of hunting. Incredible, just great success. I mean, the men are going home with fantastic amount of meat for the, the rest of the village. What more can you say? The villagers never know what's on the evening menu. There are no hunting seasons here. 
the men don't decide what to hunt, they just enter the forest and read the signs left by their prey. The Jahai survive because they know so very well the animals that they share this forest with. A new day, a new hunt. Who are going fishing? Over half of the Jahai's diet is fish. We're heading a kilometre downstream of the village, but we're not taking any nets, lines or rods. All we need is these logs, because they contain a deadly poison, rotenone. Found in at least 68 plants around the world, it's a naturally occurring insecticide used by organic farmers. It inhibits the ability of cells to absorb oxygen. The men are about to release this poison into the creek. As it flows downstream, it suffocates the fish. They rise to the surface where they're easily caught. But first, we've got to extract it. You can see that's where the branch went in on the inside there. And this is the bark area. And that seems to be what they're after because that is got the toxin. Rotenone is most deadly once it enters the bloodstream. So the men take great care not to injure themselves as they beat and then wring out the bark to release the poison. The rotenone forms a toxic foam. It's deadly, especially to children. To keep them safe, they are forbidden from leaving the village. <coughs> The Jahai are fiercely protective of their children. As a father to a young family, I understand how they feel, but I live in the UK. Here, we're surrounded by danger at all times. This is a very different world. Is it poisonous to humans? This stream will be deadly for three days. No one will drink this toxic water for several days, but the fish are safe to eat. Only small amounts of rotenone enter their bloodstream through their gills. The Jahai use the poison just once a year in each stream. This protects the fish's numbers. I think this is going to be easy. Look at that. Wow. Hey. Oh. oh no. I've dropped the first fish I dropped. Good? Good? Good food? We've got a fair few of these. These small fish are an important source of calcium for the Jahai. But can I catch one? <laughs> I didn't think I'd be catching fish with my bare hands. They are a little bit stunned though. It takes half an hour to collect all the fish from this small creek. But this isn't the only toxin that the Jahai use. Masters of poison. They know the ipo tree produces the deadliest sap of all. Just half a teaspoon could be fatal. This tree is the source of the Jahai's killing power. They've been using it for thousands of years. Kodri told me to cover my eyes because getting any of this in your eye can be very, very dangerous. It amazes me that he hasn't got any eye protection whatsoever and hasn't got one bit in his eye yet. This tree produces anterin, a cardiac glycoside. It slows, then stops the heart. This poison is strong enough to kill a man in minutes. Oh. Don't get it on yourself. Well. 
It's okay. Kalau nanti basi wai sekarang. You have to look. Ah. When I die. Basi wai, basi wai sekarang. I'll wash it. For sure. The smallest cut or scratch on my hand, and I'd be dead. To work, the poison must enter the bloodstream. The Jahai have found the perfect way to inject it. That is a lethal weapon, and there's no antidote. The men applied just the right amount to kill, without overloading the dart, because that would affect its flight. Quadri, has anyone ever stuck themselves? Dia ni dia cucu dia punya batang ni batang ling tu dia tu cucu, lepas tu dia patah. Mau tarik dia mati balik tu, dia mau cucu lagi tu dia tarik dia kena di sini, dia kena di sini. Lepas tu terus dia kata terima kasih dia kata dia punya anak tu dia tak dia pesan dia punya anak tu terima kasih anak saya mau meninggal dah. Sayang dia, aduh. These darts weigh less than one gram and are 30 centimeters long. This length gives them greater accuracy and a better trajectory. With a hand-carved flight for stability, they can travel over 180 kilometers an hour. They fly silently, so the hunters don't alert their prey when they miss. It's a crucial piece of Jahai engineering. So they just slowly slowly shaving little pieces off this palm frond into a, a round skewer like dart and then finally finally hone the end till it's like a needle oh <laughs> that is so sharp the hunters only take 10 darts per hunt I would need 100. Oh, but but in the call of 100, the lamar sikit 100. 100 to lamar sikit, mungkin dua hari baru habis 100. I would finish 200 in one hour. Rakit tua, wawe. As the world's oldest blowpipe hunters, the Jahai's skills have been honed over thousands of years. Each hunter then perfects them over his own lifetime. And now, it's my turn. So this is blowpipe school. <laughs> okay. Now there's the target. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now you show me first. I've never done this before. The quadri effortlessly balances the two meter long pipe. <laughs> first go. Oh no. I'm never going to be able to do this. So, what do I have? I've got a lot to learn. Quadri's been hunting since he was 12 years old. <laughs> this is not going to be pretty. Okay. There's the difference. Mine actually you just penetrate a few centimeters, maybe an inch or so. Theirs go right through and only leave the flight on the outside. Okay. That's two. Shall we move back here? Godri. Godri? 
Now, it's time to up the stakes. Feeling very unconfident at this point. The men can shoot accurately up to 50 metres. They could hit a can of drink from the other end of an Olympic swimming pool. Let's see how I measure up at that distance. I'm going to copy everything you do here. That is incredible. But it. Uh, but it. But it. That is incredible. Right on the target. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Oh boy, here we go. This is going to take a... I didn't even make the target. I didn't even make the range. Are you breathing from here? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely technique here. I don't have the technique or the capacity. They're like smoking all day. And they've still got better lung capacity than I have. What's that saying? Get back to the gym, HT. But for now, it's back to work. Today, all the villagers had to eat is wild tubers and tapioca. So we're going blowpipe hunting. From the moment we start this hunt, Quadri Yakub and Aziz read the forest like a book. It's late in the day, so the men know prey will be out looking for food. It's a small squirrel, but it's still food. With 35 people to feed, these hunters have to take advantage of every opportunity that this forest provides. These guys, the men here, walk through the bush barefoot and silently. Not me. Suddenly, Quadri stops us. The squirrel has frozen. It's on full alert. Squirrels can see in a 300 degree wide arc with exceptionally sharp focus. Without moving its head, it can see in detail what is below, above and next to it. Once the squirrel relaxes, it's safe for us to edge closer. Agile, camouflaged and only as big as a man's hand. These squirrels are tiny targets. I can barely see them, but Aziz is preparing to take aim. Squirrels have better sight, smell, and hearing than humans. So it's only a matter of time before it spots us. Aziz takes his shot. starts all over again. It was very interesting to watch the, how the men work together, like predators would do in the wild from what I've seen. There's, a, there's two snipers going out. One's actually ready to shoot. The other one is a spotter. Thank you. 
their teamwork pays off. Aziz has a squirrel in his sights. But one wrong move and the prey will be off. Aziz can't let his concentration waver for an instant. The squirrel is unaware that we're metres below. Aziz's first dart missed, but he's aiming for a target only 20 centimetres big. It's not even as big as my boot. He's hit it. The poison works within seconds on this small animal. There's nothing easy about getting food from this forest. Up, probably about one story high now. What are people who do What are people who do Probably about two stories high. Country. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. He's got him. He's got him. He's got him in his hand. He's got him in his hand. Wow. The dart is still in him. That is incredible. That target from about 40 meters away, I would say, at least 50 meters even. 150 feet and right in the in the ribs this hunt isn't over we need at least three squirrels to feed one family ever alert Jakub sees something Aziz hits it, even though I can't see what it is yet. Definitely heard a thud hit the ground. Not to be outdone, Quadri's got a surprise for me as well. Another one. Another one. Where? Where? Where did... Just under the... Under the arm. Best hunting professional. Incredible, mm. fantastic. What I've learned from the Jahai is that the forest is everything to them. The plants, the animals, this is their life. They're not cut off or detached from the Western world, they choose to be here. 
They need this forest for their survival and to preserve their culture. It's been a great privilege for me to learn from these amazing hunters. I'm going to take you into the world of the greatest hunters I've ever met. That's the claw marks right there. The Sand Tribe are masters of the desert. They're charging, they're charging. Keep it rolling, keep it rolling if you can. Tracking their prey for miles. Killing with poison arrows. Yeah, my heart rate's up. My heart rate's up. I'm Hayden Turner. As a zookeeper, I've cared for lots of large African animals. But today, I'm with the Sand Tribe in the Kalahari Desert, and they're hunting them. Here, wildlife is food, not a zoo exhibit. As hunters, these men's knowledge of animal behaviour here is the best on the planet. They have tracked and hunted animals in this African desert for around 60,000 years. They use arrows tipped with heart-stopping poison to kill their prey. I've got a lot to learn. This is absolutely relentless. It's difficult to put into words what's happening right now. We've been walking since six o'clock this morning. It's now about 1.30 through this incredible heat. Baking earth, acacia thorns throughout your body. My skin feels like it's actually melting off. And you're constantly getting caught on stuff. The men just do it with such ease. At the moment, that water right there looks tasty to me. Today, five of the best hunters from the village are taking me under their wing. They are led by Ngao, an elder with over 50 years of hunting experience. Ngao, now in his late 60s, has studied animals nearly all his life. This desert is his teacher and classroom. Also on the hunt are Touche, Toma, Ao and Neishi. Their village has 29 mouths to feed and they haven't eaten meat for six days. This hunt is not for sport. These men kill for food. We've picked up the tracks, also known as spoor, of a small antelope. It's a diker. There are over 15 species of diker in Africa and all are armed with super sensors, oversized ears that provide exceptionally good hearing and a brilliant sense of smell. The diker will be a seriously hard target to track. Tracking can be broken down into three main sections. Simple tracking, systematic tracking, and speculative tracking. Simple tracking is the sort of thing I can do. Follow an animal's tracks to a waterhole or something like that. Systematic tracking is a little bit more difficult. You have to know a bit about the animal's behavior and tracks and signs, symbols that they've left throughout the bush. But speculative tracking is when you come up with a plan or a hypothesis or a storyline. And that's what these men are so knowledgeable about. The men visualize the movements of the animal we're hunting to predict its behavior. They are virtually becoming the animal. I'm in Namibia, southwest Africa, in the Kalahari. Here, desert dominates the landscape. The Kalahari Desert covers an area about half the size of Mexico, just under a million square kilometers. The sand people use two unique languages, one for village and family life, and one language of clicking sounds just for hunting. You can hear the language that the men are using. Their language. Experts think that the, the series of clicks that they use was developed so animals didn't identify normal speech pattern. They understand that those 
The temperature now is 42 degrees in the shade. There's not a drop of fresh water above ground. We found these droppings. They're still moist. They can't be more than two hours old in this heat. And there are other signs of dica as well. But for now, there's a much bigger worry. Three bull elephants are feeding close by. Elephants don't have a fantastic sense of sight, but they have great hearing and great sense of smell. So if we were upwind of them, they would get our scent very, very quickly. They probably would run. If they decided to defend themselves or investigate, we'd be uh, in a bit of a position out here with not much vegetation cover and nowhere really to escape. These elephants are wild and dangerous. Aggressive males will not hesitate to take us on if they decide we're on their turf. The elephants are walking towards us here. We're in quite a spot right now. Um, okay. Touche bravely stands his ground and tries to divert the charging elephants. They're charging, they're charging. Keep it rolling, keep it rolling if you can. Elephants can run at about 30 kilometers an hour. They're going to be on top of us in about 20 seconds. I know we need to regroup, stand our ground, and turn the elephants around by making as much noise as we can. There's no time for second chances. We have to do it right and do it now. It works. The elephants call off their attack and turn tail. It's always a sin indication when the men run, I run. About 500 people are killed each year by elephants, but the animals are not to blame. Both elephants and the sand are being pushed into smaller and smaller spaces. As both animals and humans search for food and water, confrontations happen more and more. That was a close call. The guys seem pretty unfazed though, and they waste no time in refocusing and getting back to tracking the diker. They have to if they want to eat meat today. When the tracks get a little bit difficult to find, well, the men have to try and regain the tracks. They'll send two men out on the flank there, and they cover a massive area, and they come back together after they've gone back on the track. With no warning, the mood quickly changes in the men. Their body language is intense. The hunt has taken a twist. Leopard mm. is killed. My gosh, a leopard. Gosh, I've got goosebumps. Whew. We are right on the spot where a leopard has made a kill. Leopard, uh, steel rock, uh, Diker. Diker. Diker footprints there. Mm -hmm. And the leopard has grabbed it yeah. here, come, here. come this way. Mm. Look at this fur here. There's a little bit of fur just here. Right there. Right there. And then it's dragged it through here. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So exactly what a leopard would do, it would, it would walk like this and it would hold its prey in between its legs, like this. 
Like this, dragging it, dragging it. The leopard is likely to be feeding on the diker close by. Look at the drag marks here. Oh, look at that one. There's the back pad you can see right there. That's the back pad of the leopard paw. And another, all the pads there. And this is the drag mark right through here. Absolutely beautiful. I'm not entirely sure what's happening here, but we're following leopard prints. I feel like I'm in a battle of apex predators. Me and the men versus a big cat. The winner gets to eat tonight. Not a situation I ever imagined myself getting into. And this is Dykefer. And this is the opportunistic behavior of the sun. If something comes into their path, they will just follow it. We might get there, the leopard might be there, the kill might be there, who knows. Oh. Look at that. Look at that. That is incredible. Armed with brilliant camouflage, the leopard could be 10 meters away in the long grass, and we'd never see it until it was too late. Toma wants to move the diker carcass onto open ground, so if the leopard does attack, we have a chance of seeing it coming and defending ourselves. And I have to tell you now, yeah, my heart rate's up. My heart rate's up. This is where the leopard has already fed. It's taken out the chest and it's eaten, look at that, straight through those ribs. The power that's gone straight for the heart and all those really, really nutritious organs. And then it's stashed it in the bush to come back later. That's what we've got to keep an eye out on. This is not a situation you want to be in. Mm -hmm. oh, of a leopard approaching. These people rely off their environment. This is a classic indicator of predator versus predator. This is where the claws went in. Look at that. One, two, three, four. That's the claw marks right there where the animal's been held. It's, it's, it's grabbed the animal by the throat with its, mm. with its mouth and its claws have come around the back of the animal right there. Similar in body mass to a goat, this 15 kilogram carcass will provide around nine kgs of meat. Enough to feed 18 people. It'll yield a much needed 1,000 calories and over 100 grams of protein per portion. Right now, we need to eat enough to fuel our three-hour walk back to the village. Liver. Okay. Mm. Dry. Very strong. The rest of this kill will be a vital nourishing meal for the women and children. Life in the village is a day-to-day -day challenge. Illegal poaching and government pressure has eroded traditional ways. By selling handmade jewelry or trading small amounts of livestock, families make just enough money to buy maize and flour. When possible, meals are supplemented by hunting meat and giant rodents are a firm favorite. It's like they've got their tracking radar on. 
Instead of walking in a line, they're spread out and work as a team. Look, it's just beautiful to see that radar becomes from one person to five people out like that, scanning the ground constantly and reading exactly what's happened last night. Interesting to see. As the men are looking for tracks and they, th they think they're on the right spot, they always have a man out on the flank and he is checking to see if they're staying on the right spot and they haven't veered off it. we found fresh spore. The pace is picking up. Okay, yeah, look at that. Wow, so the porcupine has actually dug at this spot. This is really, really fresh, and you can see that it's dug down here, and it's eating this root right here. And this is very fresh, so this is the trail that we're on. Okay. So we've come to this clump of vegetation here. And there's porcupine burrows all the way around. But the men are looking for the freshest tracks into one of the burrows. We'll only have enough energy in this 45 degree heat to dig one or two burrows out. There is no room for guesswork. We've just come to the other side now. Porcupines have several entrances to the burrow so they can have a quick escape, but the men have blocked some, but this seems to be the one that's going to fit us. Well, him anyway. Porcupines are the largest rodent in Africa. They're nocturnal and weigh up to 30 kilograms. Their underground burrows are like secure bunkers, hard to breach with a secure central sleeping area and multiple escape routes. The only way to find the porcupine is for Toma to go into the burrow. Toma is a shy, quietly spoken man. What he lacks in conversation, he makes up for in bravery. Because he is the chosen tunnel guy. Personally, I can't believe that someone has the guts to go in there, in the dark. If Toma gets too close to the porcupine, chances are it will be super aggressive. It'll thrust its rear end in his face, stab Toma in the eyes with its spines, and potentially blind him. These porcupines are the real deal. I'm just using the night vision on this little camera because I can't physically actually fit down this hole and I can just see his feet at the moment he's gone probably about four meters five meters in Toma is totally in the dark down there if he gets nailed by the porcupine he'll definitely be on the losing side and we are hundreds of kilometers from the nearest medical help coming back Nothing. I can play in here. I'm done. The digging will quit seeing me take it. I think it will come in more. So he's actually seen the porcupine and now everyone's discussing it. Everyone's got an opinion and input to this. They're making a plan, a strategy. It's all about safety because these are incredibly dangerous and no one wants Norma to get a, uh, a spine in his face. Ngao and Al decide it's too risky for Toma in there. They want to block this burrow and dig in from the other side. All our effort will be put into digging out this burrow. Failure here will mean we won't have the strength to dig anymore. No kill means our only meal will be maize and bread back at the village tonight. That's like working a 12-hour shift and only having two slices of bread the whole day. 
After two hours of digging, the burrow is wide enough for us to get eyes on the porcupine. Okay, I'm going in. Okay, pass me that small camera. These are incredibly dangerous. And that's why there's so much strategy. He's just moving. I'm going to be very gentle. Turn this around right now. And you can see how close the Pokemon actually is. There he is right there. You can see his eye looking at me. At any point, this porcupine could come flying out of here at me. This is not a position I really want to be in for too much longer. I'm out of here. I step aside to let the professionals in. And Gal widens the burrow so Toma can get a clear shot with his spear. That's the sound of the hollow quills on the back that they use as a warning signal. Back off, back off. The kill isn't straightforward. We thought it was just one porcupine in the burrow, but it's two for one. What Toma actually saw from the other burrow was two porcupines really close together, which means double the danger here. Their spines are layered and act like a shield. To get maximum penetration, Toma must feed the spear between the spines, then push down hard to make the kill. They speared one, now they've speared the other one, and uh, now they're just trying to get them out because the quills are all facing backwards and getting caught on all the roots, so they're just trying to get them out. <laughs> the nerve endings are still active in the porcupine, and even after death, it warns us of its weapons. comes another one. The desert has provided meat for us. And Gao and his family will eat tonight. He's worked hard to provide for them. He's proud and he's happy. <laughs> Two fully grown African crested porcupines. With a combined carcass weight of over 50 kilograms, they'll provide enough meat for the whole village. Underneath those spines, there's still a big animal. There's lots of meat there. I mean, that is the size of a giant turkey. It really is going to be able to feed a lot of people. This porcupine fat will give us around 1,800 calories for each hand-sized chunk we eat, which our bodies will convert into a huge amount of energy. This is ideally suited to long periods of sustained walking and hunting. So this is the really fatty part the back part of the porcupine. Mm. Tastes good. It tastes like 
a pork yeah, I got some a pork rib or something like that uh, with a bit of a rodent aftertaste. Porcupines are plentiful, but endless poaching and the illegal bushmeat trade are robbing other essential food sources from the sand people. It's a long walk home, but I tell you, this meat is obviously just so special. Six hours of digging and hunting, and look what they've got. I survive on about two litres of water a day, whereas the men get by on about a quarter of that. The difference is, my body just isn't used to these conditions, and I'm really feeling this. I'm slowing the guys down. And I really don't want to, because the men need to get the meat back to their families. And Gao has noticed my pace slowing, but he has a solution. We've been walking for about six hours today, and I would have just walked straight past this bush. But this is the local knowledge that you need to have to survive in a place like this. This tuber, it's a tiny little plant underneath this fire stick bush. And the men are showing me here this juicy tuba they can use to get water off and survive. There's no surface water at the moment, this is the dry season. And getting this out and the men being able to get a drink might be the difference between them getting back and not getting back. We've been walking for six hours now. That and the heat are really starting to take its toll on me. To stop dehydration damaging my body, I need at least two cups of water. Tiny little shoot coming out of the ground. You wouldn't think that that massive thing is under there. Certainly does take knowledge to know that exists <laughs> under the ground from that little shoot. Look at that. So, this is a piece of tuber that could save your life. It tastes a little bit like a raw parsnip or root vegetable. It's got a really bitter aftertaste. But really juicy, lots of moisture in there. Mm. Mm. Keep going. It's actually really good. Really good. It's been one of the longest days of my life. And in all honesty, I'm dead on my feet. This desert village and its magical people make me feel very small on this earth. It feels like 60,000 years of mankind still lives on with the sand people. I get the feeling tomorrow is going to be another eye-opening day for me. Before today's hunt, Ngao wants to show me how his ancestors taught him how to use poison to kill in the Kalahari. Ngao extracts grubs of the Lebestina beetle from their hard casing. These grubs are highly poisonous. It's this poison that the hunters use to give their arrows a deadly dose. The chemical name is diamphotoxin. When the arrow enters the animal, the poison starts to break down the walls of the red blood cells. The effect is similar to being bitten by a cobra or rattlesnake. This is such an effective killer that it doesn't even show up in a forensic autopsy. I've persuaded Ngao to give me a lesson in bow hunting. The sand people have been using these for 60,000 years to kill their food. I get the feeling it isn't as easy as it looks. And there's a pretty intimidating audience. Not like this, not like this, but halfway. Okay.
That was my verbal uh, <coughs> bow and arrow school report. Seems I'm doing all right, but I need a few pointers. And uh, your knees seem to get in the way if I was the, the way I was sitting. <laughs> what a teacher, what a teacher. Gosh, that feels good. That felt very good. From this position where you feel a little, a little sort of stiff and everything and then getting down low really does feel like you're, you're drawing back and you're your whole body is actually going through that aim of that arrow. It's midday. The temperature is already up to 45 degrees in the shade. Today, I might have to walk more than 15 kilometers. The men's walking pace is more like my jogging pace. After Ngao, Touche is the second most experienced hunter. He's been the wingman to Ngao for many years, honing his skills and learning from the master. Three hours after leaving the village, Touche picks up the tracks of one of Africa's toughest antelope. This is Chemsbok. This is a, the antelope with the very, very straight horns. It's so beautifully adapted to these, these very arid and dry conditions. In medieval England, horns from the Chemsbok were sold as unicorn horns. Today, they are still high on the list for big game hunters. They can flee from many predators with speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour, which is nearly as fast as a racehorse. Ngao tests the wind. We're downwind from the Chemsbok herd. It's blowing towards us. He knows they won't pick up our scent. The hunt is on. Right next to my feet here are the tracks of a Chemsbok. And Carl and I are tracking this together. I'm following him, but there's something very beautiful about walking in the tracks or next to the tracks of the animal. You feel like you've been right there, right in the moment, exactly the same as the animal has been. The wind is in our favour, and we've had rain last night, and it's obliterated all the old tracks. So the ones we're on now are really fresh. Okay. Chaz just told me that this, believe it or not, is the scrapings and digging from the Chemsbok, from an antelope. You think it'd be done by something like a, I don't know, a burrowing animal, but it's used its hoof to dig out like that. And if you look down here, there's, a, there's bite marks on this tuber that the animal's taken bites out of. Just there, can you see that? This is one of the fantastic adaptions that these antelopes have the ability to know where to dig to get something like that. And Gao locates the herd of Hemsbok, about 500 meters ahead of us. While grazing, they're relaxed and unaware of our presence. On Ngao's instructions, we fall back to make a game plan. We will only get one shot with one arrow. If we spook the herd, the hunt is over. The pressure on us to provide for the village is massive. I'm pretty nervous about this hunt. This would be such a great catch for the men. 
I don't want to mess it up for them. Just one of these antelope would feed everyone in the village for a week. And Gao and Touche have so much hunting knowledge at their disposal. I definitely feel like a new recruit here. of the nearest adult member of the herd, so we can make a kill shot with the poison arrow. Every time I put my hands and knees on the sand, it feels like touching a stovetop. The heat is really challenging me now. And Gao and Touche do this in bare feet and still manage to move silently and effortlessly. African antelopes have brilliant hearing to detect predators. Right now, we're the predators, and we have to be so careful not to blow our cover. Ungao decides this is it. It's time to make our final approach and take our one and only shot. Something is spooking the herd. Agonizingly, they bolt. It is over for us. It could have been another predator that spooked the herd. But if it was, they'll be going hungry just like us. I feel an epic sense of failure. Five hours, crawling on my belly, burning my skin, and the heat sucking the life out of me. I'm tired and frustrated. I know the men wanted to bring home some meat tonight. I really feel for the guys, who all have families to provide for. It just showed me how hard, how phenomenally hard, these people work for beautiful food. It's every day for them. For me, I don't know if I could do it. Ngao and Touche aren't giving up so easily. They want to use the last hour of daylight to hunt. We'll only have until sundown. Being out here after dark is asking for trouble from predators such as hyenas, lions and leopards. We have to roll the dice. This will be our last chance to make a kill. Our challenge in this hunt is that the animal we're after has an armor-plated head, runs fast and can fly. And Gao and Touche will have to hit a moving target and the closest we'll get is 30 metres. This flighty flock of birds are guinea fowl. There are several species in this part of Africa. 
they can be found in flocks of up to 200. And Gao gets a shot away. But the birds are spooked. Guinea fowl aren't built for sustained flight. Flying is their last option. Instead, they run and use their camouflage to hide. I go jogging and get to the gym every week, but the fitness and stamina of these men is another level. And Ngao is nearly 70. Jason guinea fowl. You gotta stay down low, low, low like this. So you're doing this low. Leg squat for about 100 metres. And then the men unload about three or four hours each and then sprint. I'm not sure if they've got a bird or if they're just trying to get their arrows. They grab their arrows really quickly and then they go again. It's incredible fitness of these men. One of these plump birds provides more meat than a supermarket chicken. That's if we can kill one. And Gao and Touche work as a sniper team, taking it in turns to be the spotter, one shooting as the other one reloads. All in perfect silence. Unlike army snipers though, our ammunition, the poison arrows, are not expendable and each one must be retrieved and, if possible, mended. Got so close to a flock of guinea fowl, but they've got hundreds of eyes watching, hundreds of birds, really hard. Got a stalk very, very low, and I tried to hang back a little bit to give the guys more of a chance because my boots going through these rocks make so much noise. And Gao and Touche get their eyes on the birds again. I'm going to hang back and try to keep the noise down. They're within 30 metres. I've got to see this. And Gao is the most experienced, takes the first shot. The arrow misses by millimetres. Touche shoots, misses, and Gao shoots. A hit. interested in finding the really important part of the arrow. I'm trying to bring my heart rate down. A perfect shot, straight through the chest cavity. Sam Cow is showing me a perfect example of here how the arrow works. The arrow has broken off at exactly the right point. It's broken off just there at that link shaft, exactly as it's been designed to. The poison takes effect and the bird dies. Guinea fowl are very, very plentiful around here. It's called a helmeted guinea fowl. You can see by that really wonderful structure on its head there. Good food, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good meat. Accuracy, beautiful design, and huge amount of skill and I've seen it firsthand. It's a great privilege. Great privilege. My time with the San has been an incredible learning curve. 
It's been a dream come true for me. I've learned about tracking and behavior from the best in the world. I just hope this knowledge is passed on to future generations and not lost forever.